Exodus chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. For Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon. Thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen, in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps into mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. <clears throat> so in this... In this series, Put to Death, what I'm talking about is capital punishment. So capital punishment is the death penalty. It's when a government is sanctioned uh, or has a sanctioned practice, and I believe a God-ordained practice, of putting criminals to death for certain crimes. So my first dealings I want to go into are sins of violence regarding capital punishment. Now, go to John chapter 19 and verse 11. John chapter 19 and verse 11. <clears throat> Again, the death penalty is something that is scriptural. It's something that God ordained. We need not shy away from this, though it might be uncomfortable. In John chapter 19 in verse 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Now this is in regard to Pilate saying now to him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus' response is clear. Unless God gives you the power, you got no power at all. Therefore, the second part of verse 11, Therefore, he that hath delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. That phrase, the greater sin, is just highlighting the fact that all sins are not equal. Amen. There is a greater and there is, by extension, a lesser sin. I also like how God proves here that Pilate has no power, but God gives it to him. And God does give governments lots of powers over lots of things. And one of the areas and avenues whereby the government has power is in regard to the death penalty, capital punishment. 
God ordained that the government could have and should have a sanctioned method and mode of putting criminals to death. Now this study should, again, dismantle any idea that all sins are equal. People often say that. Well, all sins are equal. And they usually do that in regard to the rainbow people. Right? Oh, you can't condemn them because you lie. You, you can't condemn the murderer because you stole a pencil, right? They'll say all sin is equal in the sight of God. Where do they get that from? James chapter 2, I believe, is the most common. James chapter 2. The most common place where they will go and they'll say, well, all sin is equal. Even though clearly, 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 John chapter 19 and verse 11, Jesus says, they got the greater sin. Meaning, you got the lesser sin, Pilate. In James chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, the Bible says, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as a transgressor. So what's Jesus trying to say here? If you keep, through James, right? He's saying, if you keep the royal law, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. Good job. But if you have respect of persons, you commit sin. Okay, so you're doing well, you're also committing sin at the same time. Now this isn't a teaching that we've got to balance them all out. Commit more righteousness than unrighteousness, and then we're going to get to heaven. No, no, no. This is just fulfilling and showing a very important part of all of our gospel presentation, which is what? We say you're a sinner, right? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's not a just man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That's a very important part of our gospel presentation. Making everybody realize that they are a sinner and they're in lockstep with the whole world. And so here he begins and he says, fulfill the royal law, doing good. But if you have respect of persons, you're convinced of the law as a transgressor. Verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Oh, there it is. See? See, you keep the whole law, you're a pretty good person, but you've lied, therefore you're guilty of all. Is that what that's saying here? In other words, because I've lied, or because I stole a pencil, or because I, you know, such, leave in your mundane little sin, right? Because of that, I'm, I'm guilty of murder. I'm guilty of fornication. I'm guilty of, is that what that's saying here? No. He's saying you keep the whole law and offend at one point, you're guilty of all. What does that mean? You're convinced of the law as transgressors. Verse 11, for he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, you're innocent in that, right? You commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. The law at large is basically one entity. And that includes these Ten Commandments that we've read. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. That constitutes the law. And there are many more laws in this. In fact, many times the law is referred to just as the, the Old Testament itself. Sometimes it's referred to just as the first five books. The law is what it's saying to. And he's saying here that, yeah, you may not commit adultery, but you've killed. Therefore, you're guilty of Oh, what does that mean? You've become a transgressor of the law. You've broken the law. Therefore, all the law falls upon you. You're not guilty of each point. He's just trying to finalize and show that if you offend in one point, what does that make you? A transgressor. It makes you a sinner. Being a, being a thief doesn't make you a fornicator. But it does make you a transgressor of the law. Being a murderer doesn't make you an adulterer. But it makes you a transgressor of the law. You're, you're simply being shown that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in another way. God's just highlighting the fact of what? You need Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 24 says, The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So what is the law supposed to do? Each of these Old Testament statutes and judgments and commandments are there simply to... Bring us to the point where we realize we're lost sinners under transgression of the law, and therefore we need faith of Christ. That's all it's there for. As it clearly says in Galatians, as a schoolmaster, it brings you up to the point where you say, Oh, I'm a sinner. I can't get to heaven. I need Christ. I need to be justified by faith. Now, back in, we're dealing with specific ones now. I think we're all in agreement that sin... That, that no two sins are alike, and especially in regard to the punishments here on earth. There are lesser sins and there are greater sins. 
back, if you would, you could look back in Exodus chapter 20. You don't necessarily have to go there. I can quote it. Thou shalt not kill, right? Thou shalt not kill was the sixth commandment. It was found there in verse 13. Thou shalt not kill. Now, this is one of the commands, but does this command make my whole sermon topic completely moot? Because when you're putting somebody to death, aren't you killing them? When you're exhibiting, when the government is putting forth capital punishment and punishing somebody for their sins, aren't they killing? <clears throat> well, go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Jesus gives those commandments again, and he gives them to a specific person and brings them to kind of a, a, a more modern way of understanding it. Thou shalt not kill. So we can't even put people to death. We can't put criminals, criminals to death because we would be breaking God's law when we did so. Here's a contradiction in the scriptures, many will say. But in Matthew chapter 19, and in verse 16, it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto them, Why callest me thou good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. What's he think? saying? What good thing are you looking for? Hey, just keep the commandments and you can enter into life. And that's true. Were this rich man able to keep all of the commandments, he would have life. But no one's ever done that except Jesus, ironically, the one that's saying there's none good but one, is that, and that's God. Why are you calling me good? He saith unto him, verse 18, which, Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Covetousness was the, essentially the crime that this guy could not let go of. But of course when he made the statement that all of these I have kept from my youth up, that was a lie in of itself because the commandments are there. Even those ten commandments are there as your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. They're showing everybody that we can't keep them. And yet all of those at the mount promised, of course we will keep all of these Moses. We promise, right? Fools. <laughs> All it was there was to point us to the fact that we need Christ. That's why the commandments are there. And in this passage, in verse 18 specifically, thou shalt do no murder. That's thou shalt not kill. So that's what Jesus is talking about. That's what God is talking about in the Old Testament when he says, thou shalt not kill. It's thou shalt not murder. There's a difference then between killing, taking a life, and murder, taking a life. Exodus chapter 21, I'll read in uh, verse 12. Exodus 21 and verse 12, it says, He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. Now, murder is a grievous sin. The punishment thereof is, is something that was instituted long before even these Ten Commandments came down. I'm not sure if you're aware. Go to Genesis chapter 9. So God here says, Thou shalt not kill. And then right in the immediate context, he explains more so, he that smiteth the man so that he die shall surely be put to death. Jesus says, do no murder is what's being talked about here. Back in Genesis chapter 9 is where actually God, post-flood, instituted the death penalty. Genesis chapter 9, look at verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So he's saying to Noah and to his sons, be fruitful, multiply, create more life. We need more life. Replenish the earth, refill the earth, have tons of babies. Life seems to be something of great importance to God because as soon as he finished wiping out most life, he said, replenish it. We need more life. Go, be fruitful, multiply. So life is very important to God. Verse 2, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you. So here God, I believe, is distinguishing the fact that, that human life is what's really important to him. 
Because he's saying that they have dominion over the fish and the fowl and the things of the sea. They're delivered into the hands of the men that are to go fruitfully multiply. Everything that liveth is meat for them, for humans, for us, for substance, is what God here is promised. I have given you of all things. You have dominion. Your life is important to me so much so that I have given you stewardship over all the other life that I have created. But, verse 4, flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So he says here that the life is in the blood. Blood is what carries the life source. The life blood we often talk about. In verse 5 it says, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. The life of man is what's important here, and what's on God's heart when he saith, in verse 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for, or because, in the image of God made he man. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. He has an important and privileged spot on his heart for men. Therefore, when men go at arms with other men and shed their blood, there's great offense to it, no matter what the first man's reasoning was. He said, you've shed the blood, the life of someone that is made in my image. And God takes offense in that. Now, because we are precious, because we are special creature of God's image, that's why he instituted a law such as, Whoso smiteth a man that he die, or whoso sheddeth man's blood, by, his, by, by man's shall his blood be shed. In other words, death comes as a result of somebody causing death. Now we know that we're of more importance than beasts. Go to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. Just from God's explanation here, when he says, you've got dominion over these things. It's man's life that I'm concerned with. And whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. So of course we're more important than beasts. Exodus chapter 21 and verse 28 deals with the relationship between a man who has authority or 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 a position of power over a beast, and how he ought to control that. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 28, the Bible says, If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall be surely stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. What's he saying here is that if your ox, if your beast gores a man that he dies, that beast is disposable toward the precious life of a man. So get rid of the beast. Don't even eat the thing. Destroy it by stones. But in verse 29, it continues, though the first case, the owner of the ox was quit, the second case is not so. But if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past. In other words, he was known for pushing on people, for thrusting his horn violently at others. If he was known for that in the past, and it hath been testified to his owner. In other words, there was witnesses. Hey, your ox is pushing on me. Your ox is dangerous. Your ox is potentially going to harm somebody. It was close the last time. Verse uh, 29 continues, And he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman. The ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. And this is an indication that your property is an extension of you. Thereby, when we have something like vehicular manslaughter that goes on, where somebody hits somebody with their car, your possession was an extension of you, and thereby, the person sh that was driving the vehicle should be punished for the crime. In the same way, in this context, we have an ox that was wont to push a four time. The owner knew about it. He didn't do the proper precautions and bring that thing in so that it wouldn't hurt anybody. And therefore, his, his, uh, his foolishness in not binding that thing and allowing it opportunity to hurt caused that the ox was put to death and the man was put to death. He was responsible for his property. And he didn't take proper care of that thing. So the first case, we had an accident, a beast hurt a man. The second case, we had a beast who was known to do that, that hurt the man, and therefore the owner was put to death. And that's a 
violent crime. It wasn't the owner that did it, but rather his beast, but he should have had ownership over that thing and put it into its proper place. Verse 30, if there be laid on him a sum of money, and then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him, whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter according to the judgment that shall be done to him, if the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. So those stipulations are attached to verse 28. When your beast, obviously a man that is dead can't pay out the, the ransom of, of such an accident. But, but if, if he's still alive, he would pay out the ransom that would be according to what's prescribed here. What do we have quite often that is likened unto this? Because not many of you have oxes. <laughs> what about the pit bulls? What about the dogs that people keep? What about these beasts that are, especially the pit bulls, that are wont to push with their horns, that are wont to bite with their teeth, that, that have, are known to be violent? And people have even little dogs that are known to be violent. They ought to be kept in... Otherwise, I believe that the owner thereof, when that pit bull goes and, and, and gnashes a child to bits, kills the child, that owner ought to be put to death along with the dog. I believe that. If he was wont to do it before time, if he was known, and the owner was not was foolish enough to allow that thing at a child, at a person, and, and, the, and the injuries were so much so that the, a death was caused, that person ought to be put to death. I believe that. It should be applied today. <clears throat> Having no control over your beast or over your property is a sin than unto death. Human trafficking is the next one. Exodus chapter 21 and verse 16. Exodus chapter 21 and verse 16 it says, And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Stealing a man and selling him, this is another grievous sin that falls under the category of violence. Okay? Making a man, taking a man and making them your property for the purpose of buying them and selling them and moving them around as if they were a commodity, it's wicked. We saw it in slavery. We're hearing whispers of it going on in the upper echelons of our society. Right? These, these, these things that come out, you know? And then we find out that Epstein didn't kill himself. Why? Right? Because he knew of all these people running these child trafficking things and he was silenced. He deserves death. But it would have been nice if he was able to, you know, expose the others and they right. could be, suffer that same fate, right? <clears throat> Ultimately, God feels, and I believe and feel, that human trafficking, kidnapping people, selling them, moving around, death penalty. Hands down. Amen. No ifs, ands, or buts. If somebody is caught making merchandise of another person, they ought to be put to death. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 12 says, It is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them. In secret, and and we can only we can only we shouldn't even begin to imagine what's going on with these children. But but uh, by the droves, children are going missing in our country, in our civilization, in our world, never to be found again. Some of them we find them many 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 years later, only to hear of the horror stories of what happened when they were first scooped up on their front line. So we need to be mindful of that to watch out for our children. And I believe that if somebody is found out to be doing this, they ought to be put to death. Stealing a man, selling him, human trafficking, death penalty. Amen. Giveth seed unto Moloch. Go to Leviticus, if you would. Go to Leviticus chapter 20. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Numbers. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 20. That giveth his seed unto Moloch. You can read in verse 2. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 2. Again, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Now here, what is this? <laughs> What is giving your seed unto Moloch? Seed is your offspring. Seed is your children. Child sacrifice. Exactly. Moloch was this brazen god, shaped like Baal, with the big, big horns and, and, and human-like uh, characteristics. He was out there just outside of the city, and he was your what your modern-day Planned Parenthood resembled back in those days. So somebody would take a child after they had birthed it, and whether it was for 
um, religious favor, whether it was for convenience, whether it was, it was for uh, pressures from without, whether it was just because they didn't have the faith or the guts to raise up the child, they would take that child and bring it unto Moloch. Just as we have abortion clinics lining the streets of our cities and the streets of our countries where people can come and for convenience sake kill their children, so it was back in the day, there's no new thing under the sun. And so Moloch then was this great big brazen god, and not getting too graphic, his belly was full of fire. And brass with fire underneath it gets very hot. And so his hands were out as a statue to receive of the sacrifice. The people then would take the child and place it upon the hands. And the child would be on these scorching hot things as they fell into the fire. Okay, that's what history tells us of this god, Moloch. It's wickedness. And whosoever is found doing that ought to be put to death. In that context and in the context today, I believe the same. Planned Parenthood is modern day sacrifice unto Moloch. Now, I, I heard the quote. I couldn't track it down. But I believe it came from like a, a Wiccan who ran one of these Planned Parenthood. And she said, your First Amendment right to, to worship your God and to serve your God is the same one that I follow. You follow your Christ and serve him how you will. I follow my gods and serve them by ritualistic human sacrifice. This was a few years ago. I couldn't find the quote. I'll probably try to dig it up. But this was a owner of a Planned Parenthood who was a Wiccan admitting that ritualistic child sacrifice was what went on behind those doors. She did it for favor. She did it for convenience to the others. She did it for whatever reason, but either way, it's wicked and death is deserved as a result of it. Amen. The Bible is clear that whosoever giveth their seed unto Moloch shall surely be put to death. And in this context, it says very clearly that the people of the land shall be the ones that stone them with stones. Now, Today we have this coronavirus running rampant. 250,000 people worldwide this year have died from it. In that same time frame, abortion has claimed 56 times more life. 14 million deaths this year, all on the altar of Mola. People sacrificing their children. Death should be the penalty for those doctors. And if there weren't those doctors, then there wouldn't be the women who wouldn't have an outlet to be able to make that decision. I believe that many times women are convinced to do very dumb and wicked things. And they make the wrong decision. And you will find anybody that is honest that does not have a seared conscience will regret what they did, even in the moments that it happens. Mm -hmm. Women know that they're pregnant. I've heard it testified millions of times. They say it's just an infinitesimal small nothingness that they're removing from you. But that woman is already a mother. That child is already a child. And they have a connection and a bond that lasts forever. And then it's erased because somebody convinced these women that that is just simply health care. But it's not. That's, that's nothing more to these wicked devils behind the gloves and the masks as ritualistic human sacrifice. They're making fortunes. They're pleasing their gods by doing those wicked things that they do behind closed doors. And I believe they should be put to death. If they were put to death, where would they go? The clinics would be empty. Okay? The Bible is clear. Also, though, for those that offer their seed to Moloch. Now, glory to God, there is grace extended for people that, unbeknownst to them, make dumb decisions in their life and do something like that. Okay? The Apostle Paul took part in murdering Christians, and he had grace. God extended him grace to the point where he could be saved and now stand there as a changed man, as a new man. You don't have to be under the burdens. If you have committed, a, a, if you have had an abortion, you don't have to be under the burdens of that. You are born again. You are changed. You are a new man. You are a new woman in Christ. You don't have to be under that burden and under that, that turmoil always. Just, just ask for forgiveness and move on with your life. But the Bible is clear, too, that those that were offering their seed unto Moloch, it doesn't seem like they were in a case where they could be deceived. <laughs> Do you think that a, a, a woman or, or a man bringing their child to a giant brazen altar could be convinced that this, this precious life was just, you know, a, an infinitesimal speck of cells? 
No, they, they beheld the child. They, they knew the child. They had seen the child when they put it up there and offered it. Therefore, the death should be upon them. And I feel the same way about those, and they're out there, that abort and abort and abort and abort as some sort of form of birth control. They're going to go out and live like whores and do whatever they want to do. And their birth control is just like a once a month trip to Planned Parenthood. And that is where that would play in. Where, where literally the people of the land ought to, if we were living in a righteous nation, stone the doctor, stone the woman with stones. Because they need to be judged according to these things. <clears throat> Verse 2 in, uh, in chapter 20 there. It says, the people of the land shall stone him with stones. Verse 3, it says, and I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed to Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. There's a finality here in judgment where God literally turns his face from the person that, not that they were deceived, they knew what they were doing. God turns his face from them because they have defiled his holy name. They defiled his sanctuary. Verse 4, it says, And if the people of the land do in any wise hide their eyes from the man that giveth of his seed unto Moloch and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go whoring after him to commit whoredoms with Moloch from among their people. God's putting ownership on the people of that nation to set these things right, to put that people to death. The, the murderer, as well as those offering their children, ought to be put to death. God doesn't want us turning a blind eye to these sorts of things. And yet, here we are in our nation often turning blind eyes to these things. Is there any judgment for the abortion clinics? Nope. They're open right now. All full steam ahead. Running just like they always did. You think they're minding the social distancing? You think they've got any kind of special um, conditions set up when you go into those clinics? No. Business as usual in that filthy environment, and it should not be so. God says even the people of the land that hide their eyes from it are going to suffer a judgment whereby God would set his face against them. And then we're wondering why our nation of Canada is not being blessed of God. It's because we have by and large turned a blind eye to the wickedness of abortion in our nation when we should be focusing our eyes on it as we cast stones the government were to lead us to do so appropriately, then things would be right. Finally, God would have recompense upon the, the, the sin, and then the land could be cleaned and cleansed and healed. Now, killing then, as we know, is, a, is the taking of a life. And we saw that in regard to an animal that I own taking someone's life. We saw that in regard to the, the men stealing or kidnapping. That's taking a life when you think about it. Somebody's being scooped up from their life and their choices don't matter anymore. They're now a possession. They're now something to just be handed freely about. You're sold here, you're going there, you're sold here, you're doing this, you're doing that. Their life has been removed from them. That's, that's killing a life, I believe. Violence to the innocent, being the sacrifice of children in the womb, which we now think because it's more sterile, perhaps we don't have to worry about it as much. It's a completely different thing. Of course, women these days wouldn't actually put their newborn child upon on a brazen altar to offer it unto some devil, but it's one and the same. It's killing. It's murder. And that last one that I want to talk about is that phrase, murder. The premeditated being something that is, is, is a capital offense and something that would make somebody guilty of um, a crime and should be put to death. Now, Exodus chapter 21, we're there, and in verse 12, the Bible says, Exodus 20 and verse 12. I'm in Leviticus, that's my problem. <clears throat> Exodus 21, 12 says, He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. This is referring to premeditated murder. Smiteth a man that he die put to death. You know what smiting means? It's, it's a firm strike. It's, a, it's, a, it's the use of force, an implement. There is, there, is a, there is an engagement with the item to go and perform the crime. Smiteth a man that he die, he shall surely be put to death. Now is this in all cases? 
We know that Jesus called killing murder. Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24 talks a little bit more about this. Jesus called killing murder, therefore thou shalt not kill means by extension, according to Christ, <clears throat> thou shalt do no murder. Leviticus 24 and verse 17, the Bible says, Leviticus 24 and verse 17, And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. Again, highlighting the idea of murder. Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35 continues and highlights different types of killing and how they would actually play out in the economy of Old Testament Israel. Numbers chapter 35. Numbers 35. I'm going to begin in verse 9 and read as you find Numbers 35. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye become over Jordan into the land of Canaan, that ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person at unawares. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. And of these cities, which ye shall give six cities, shall ye have for refuge. And I think when you get the idea of whoso sheddeth man's blood, by him shall blood be shed, we get the idea that this just this, this swift reaction, like a response, a retaliation. But God's going to start to show us, as he does here, that there is a city of refuge appointed in the economy and in the nation, these six cities where you can go as a manslayer to await your appointed time to stand before judgment, before all the congregation in judgment. And these cities were there for that specific reason. They were of refuge. So that the accidental or the unawares killing of somebody could be something where they could judge and, and, and determine whether or not death penalty would come into place. Verse 16 in Numbers chapter 35 says, verse 16, And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer, the murderer shall surely be put to death. So if there is an item that was taken to use as a tool for murder, he's put to death. Verse 17 says likewise, And if he smite him with throwing of a stone, wherewith he may die, or he and he die, he is a murderer, the murderer shall be surely put to death. Verse 18, Or if he smite him with an hand, with an hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer, the murderer shall surely be put to death. And so here, a tool or an implement that was used with specific reason to cause damage that actually caused death, you're a murderer, you're put to death. Quite often these, uh, these crimes of passion, they call them, don't involve an implement, because quite often an implement's not there. But the idea that there is a specific implement, I believe, gives credence to the fact that there was a premeditation that took place, and therefore it was judged as a death penalty by who? By the congregation that they stood before in judgment. Verse 19, it says, The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. So in these situations where the, the judgment was clear that he ought to be put to death, it was the revenger of blood. The law demand that the revenger of the blood take the law into his own hands. And like I said, I don't believe that this is just uh, this kind of renegade row type of judgment where as soon as I am convinced myself that somebody did a crime, I can just go as the revenger of blood hurt by the scenario and just put that person to death. Rather, it plays out as a courtroom and as a judgment type of scenario. Verse 20, it says, But if he thrust him of hatred or hurl at him by lying of weight that he die, or if enmity, if in enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death. For he is a murderer, the revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. So what's this talking about? If there was hatred before, if there was lying in wait before, if there was a perceived enmity the time aforetime, it's a murder. It's a scenario where somebody hated somebody in their heart enough to go 
and lay in wait. Go and in the hatred and enmity of their heart, perhaps even take an implement and perform the murder. That is a death penalty, according to the scriptures. Verse 22 then says, But, here's the contrast, If he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or have cast upon him anything without lying of wait, or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him, that he die, and was not his enemy, neither sought he harm, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. What's happening here? Proper judgment is taking place. And if the scenario were that there was a sudden response, in other words, one of those crimes of passion where somebody just kind of just somebody came at them maybe and they responded in retaliation and ended up killing a person, right? Or if there was a scenario where somebody cast a stone and unbeknownst to them, there was someone on the other side to receive that stone and die an accidental death. Or if, if there was no harm thought, no harm sought of, and no hatred before time and there's a death that happens, this falls into the second category where he's not off scot-free, but the congregation meets together in judgment after the murderer, after the sorry killer, finds refuge in one of these places of refuge. And this is where we have a little bit of a, a, a contrary idea to what the Canadian government teaches. Because this says if somebody um, thrusts him suddenly, right, and what would that instance be? That would be someone breaks into my house. And, and my response is just, I didn't premeditate it. I didn't know this person. I didn't hate this person. A criminal comes in my house. I thrust them suddenly. Maybe I push them down the stairs. Maybe, maybe I hit them with something that I find in my house or, or whatever I did to defend myself and my family. Quite often, it's actually the person that did the, did the attack in self-defense that ends up being put to death. The, gun, the, the rules are such that I can't even defend myself in my own home. A criminal can't even fall off my roof without me, me succumbing to the, 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 the criminal courts in that action. But here the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of the blood according to these judgments. So they look at the scenario that happened and they decide who is guilty in this. Whether the man was just in his actions towards the person and just in causing that death. Verse 25, And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whither he was fled. And he shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. But if the slayer at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whither he was fled, and the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, and the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of his blood, because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. So this doesn't mean that when somebody is determined to have committed killing in the second degree. We call it second degree murder. It was, it was an accident. It was a crime of passion. This doesn't mean that in God's economy, they're just off scot-free. We see very clearly that there's a specific place, a specific city of refuge where they're to live out their days until the death of the high priest, an appointed time where they can have refuge. They can keep their life, but regardless, you've shed blood. Regardless, there is a price to pay. And unfortunately for these, it's mobility. They couldn't move from this one location. They had to stay put and they had to wait until the death of the high priest, a certain time had passed, and then finally now they could go out. If they were to leave that city of refuge and the revenger of blood fell upon them, in other words, if somebody killed somebody's wife and the revenger of blood was obviously the husband because he was most directly hurt from it. If he finds that person, though he accidentally killed the wife, outside of refuge, then he goes at him and there's no blood, there's no response for that. Why? Because it's another one of these instances where it's a crime of passion. The revenger of blood is quite often traumatized and hurt and distraught by the scenario. And so they'll do whatever they can to make sure that that person gets put to death, even if it isn't righteous in the sight of the word of God. But that's just how things is. Now, how do they stop the, the renegade, the rogue judgment of taking place? Well, it's clear. Verse 30. It says in verse 29, So these things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Verse 30. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. 
But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. So here clearly two witnesses required. The Bible says at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Therefore, somebody can't just say, oh, I'm the revenge of the blood. This is what happens. He murdered my, my family member and, and he needs to be put to death. No, it needs to have multiple witnesses. And that's why the congregation and that assembly where the judgment is taking place is so important because they're going to interview the different witnesses and find out what the truth of the matter is. One person cannot put a murderer to death. There needs to be at least two, preferably three. Verse 31 says, Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. No satisfaction, that means there is no bail. That means there is no refuge. No price they can pay is high enough to account for the life that is in the blood that they shed. And so, if they're guilty of murder, they need to be put to death. Why? It means because, because whether it was accidental or no, or whether you have a ton of money or not, you shed blood, you took life, and you were responsible for that. You ought to be put to death, according to the scriptures, and according to how it is today. These crimes of violence that we have um, listed here, murder, kidnapping, um, you know, uh, man-stealing, all of these things are, are, are serious offenses. They're grievous sins. They're greater sins in the eyes of God, such that he would put somebody to death that was guilty of them. Now, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And we have a court system now. Now, first of all, they don't follow the Bible at all. They throw people in cages as the, as the, as the principal punishment if they're guilty of first-degree murder. It should be death. But it's not even a speedy judgment. We see very clearly here the crime happens, whether it, whether it was an accident or whether it was murder. Quickly gets to the city of refuge. Quickly judgment takes place. And quickly the person is either exonerated to refuge there forever or they're put to death. And because we don't do that in this country, the heart of sons of men in this nation is fully set in them to do evil. Right. The whole point of the death penalty is to encourage that people don't commit the same crimes. It's to force people to think long and hard about murdering, about kidnapping, about offering their children to Moloch. You think if, if one, two, three, a dozen of these abortion doctors were put to death, there would be another clinic shooting up in your neighborhood? Uh-uh. You think that if there was people being put to death, stone by stones, by the people that they had hurt in the act, you think that there would be more murderers? No. You think that people would be running about kidnapping if the second a kidnapper was found, they brought them to the people and the people were the first to throw stones at them and to destroy them? No. And if the judgment was according to what the Bible says, where two or three witnesses and no satisfaction taken place, and a proper judgment made about what's right and what's wrong, and then finally, speedily, sentences taken out, then people would think long and hard about committing these sins. If the death penalty was instituted, it would be one of the greatest things that could happen to our nation. Why? Our nation? Why? Because men would see and hear and fear God. There would be a healthy fear of breaking the righteous judgments of God upon our whole nation. Nobody would be running about just, just, just committing murders. No one would be running about going to these abortion clinics. There would be less and less and less of this until nearly nothing would take place, on, on the, especially in, in, in regard to the numbers that we are seeing of all these crimes going on. Swift justice purifies men through fear. They see, they fear. I'm not doing that. It's like children, right? There's two right here. <laughs> When one of them got corrected, quite often, I bet you the other one was like, oh, hey, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to do that same thing. I saw and I fear. Lily saw what happened to John when John did that. And Lily's like, I'm not doing that. Right? See and fear. Why? Because swift judgment fell and the punishment was rendered. And the others look and they're like, yeah, I'm not going to be involved in that. I'm not going to do such and such a crime. Not only does swift justice purify men through fear, it also keeps the land pure. Look at verse 33. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are. For blood, it defileth the land. What defiles the land? Blood. 
defiles the land. In other words, when there's murders, when there's man-stealing, when people don't have control over their beasts and they're, and they're ripping people to shreds, when there's, when there's murder and abortions running rampant, when blood is being shed in the land, blood, it defiles the land. And verse continues and says, And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. So how does a land get cleansed of blood that is shed upon it? The one that shed it must be blood, must be shed himself. In other words, a murderer that sheds blood, that blood will defile a land until that murderer is put to death. And what do we have now? Hordes of murderers in prison. Hordes of violent criminals locked in a cage. Reserved there and allowing for us as a nation to be reserved unto the judgment of God. Because he will recompense for the blood of people made in his image that was shed in any nation. So what are we doing? We're just locking them up in cage. Just, just mocking at the law of God where we should be actually swiftly judging these things. How, having it so that people see and fear and start living more righteously and aren't emboldened to commit these same crimes. Swiftly executing judgment will keep this land pure because blood defiles a land from which it cannot be cleansed unless, unless the murderer is put to death, unless the criminal is put to death. Retribution needs to be made where God dwells. Is God dwelling in this nation? I, I don't know. He's certainly dwelling in his people. But do you think he wants to walk around in a nation that's full of abortion, that's full of murder, that's full of kidnapping, that's full of all sorts of violent crimes that are going unpunished? I don't think God just walks around freely in a nation such as these. Certainly he indwells his people, but where he dwells, look what it says in verse 34. Defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit, wherein I dwell. For I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel, and spiritually speaking, we're all the children of Israel. I would love for God to come in and dwell the nation of Canada, but it's not so. The land is defiled. The land is polluted. The land is filthy by reason of the crimes that have taken place here and are unpunished. There's unresolved work. There's, there's, there's unfinished business. And God looks upon this land and sees it polluted. He sees it in contempt. He wants nothing to do with a nation that would allow for all of this blood to be shed and would do nothing about it. Murderers, these, these vicious dogs that owners are lying and kill them. Abortionists, these kidnappers, they should all be put to death and instead they're in cages. Their blood is upon us today. Their blood is upon our land today because swift judgment, swift judgment, Sentence is not executed upon the crimes according to the word of God, according to the will of God. And these are just a few of the things, and I want to talk about more as we go along. Different areas where God institutes a death penalty, and when death isn't sentenced speedily, wickedness abounds. When crime isn't punished appropriately and speedily, sinners get emboldened to do more. Think about it. Some of these people have nothing to lose. What's a murder? I go into prison. What do you get in prison? Free Wi-Fi, free food, free television, free, free ride, right? Most lowlifes could care less about what's going on there. In fact, they go there and they learn more. And nowadays, they go there and they're being let out because they're saying, I'm afraid of COVID. And so they just let them free. Thousands, you realize, are now walking the streets of murderers. So what are they doing here in our nation? Instead of putting the murderers to death, they're releasing them freely into society and taking good law-abiding citizens and caging them up in their own homes. It's craziness and it's backwards. And then we wonder why God's not blessing this nation because God will not inhabit a defiled nation. He will not recompense the blood that has been shed here until justice comes. Amen. How does justice come? Death penalty. Put to death. These criminals, these violent criminals.